Evening or morning, everybody. Uh, Christopher here, and this is my newest segment called So You Want to Make Comics. This is a segment devoted to understanding the art and craft behind creating comic books. It's not just a matter of taking a story and, and drawing it. There's a big amount of, of uh, what, what would you call it, language. But uh, I thought this would be a good way to interview some great comic book professionals and here with me today, I'm very honored to have Mike Barron. Mike has worked for DC Comics, Dark Horse, Malibu Comics, Marvel Comics. Uh, he is the creator of The Badger and Nexus. He's worked on many titles like Batman, Dead Man, The Punisher. Uh, Mike, welcome to the show and thank you for being on. Thank you, Chris. So uh, I guess the, the first thing to, to get started with is, you know, we're, we're going to talk about uh, your upcoming book, which is an Indiegogo for Offworlder, and also you are a novelist, so I'm, I'm very interested in your, your perspective on writing for different mediums. Uh, but I think really what I'm interested in knowing first is, and it, it, is not just how did you get into the comic book writing industry but what was it like starting out as a professional comic book artist uh what was your view of writing comics then and how did it evolve to how you handle the art now well i always wanted to be a writer ever since i was a little kid and picked up uh, an uncle scrooge comic in mitchell south dakota uh, Right after college, I moved to Boston and worked on various newspapers, and I met a number of great illustrators there. Uh, and although I was a journalist for many years uh, and an editor at those papers, my only interest was in writing fiction. My opportunity came when I moved back to Madison, Wisconsin, and I met Steve Rood. Uh, the dude showed me his drawings. He wanted to do comics, but he couldn't write. I wanted to do comics, so I couldn't draw, so we agreed to team up. We were in the right place at the right time. So I conceived Nexus as a 12-page origin story originally, uh, and uh, the dude drew it, and we showed it to uh, the folks at Capital City Distribution. They wanted to publish their own books. It was a lot of luck. We were in the right place at the right time, and they said, yes, go ahead. Uh, and so they published Nexus, and it was such a hit uh, that my career took off from that point on. Because of Nexus, I was asked to write for Marvel and DC. Uh, back then, I would write comics by drawing each page out by hand. Uh, I draw the page on a, a legal pad. I divide it up into panels, and I'd start with the first panel, uh, and then I'd say, "Well, what goes in the second panel?" Because the essential question in all fiction is, "What happens next?" And this was a real nuts and bolts lesson in thinking about what happens next. I would just do it by the seat of my pants, and yet I had a good sense of story structure, of story dynamics, of when to go big, when to go down, when to go loud, when to go soft, a good sense of just how much dialogue uh, a panel would hold, and a good sense of when to let the pictures uh, tell the story. As a writer, I have three rules. Well, I have a, I have a thousand, but the three rules that I always repeat is, number one is the writer's job is to entertain. Mm -hmm. Number two is show, don't tell. And that's often the hardest thing. What's going on there? What's going on? <laughs> you hear that? I have a little dachshund puppy that's uh, running back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. The, the... Number two, show, don't tell. And number three, be original. Uh, I followed this method for many years, and then I had a hiatus when I didn't write at all. And when I came back to it, my methods had changed completely. Uh, I now believe in outlining, uh, and I write full script, uh, and my outlines are designed to entertain the reader, so that if I hand somebody the outline, they read it, they say, yeah, where's the book, where's the comic, I want to read that now. My goal as a writer is always to grab the reader by the throat and drag him into the narrative to the exclusion of all else. It took me a long time to learn how to write a novel, but when I got it, I got it. Uh, most writers, they struggle all their lives. Is it any good? Is it, you know, will I be laughed at? And I struggled that way for 30 years with prose, never with comics, but with prose. But I no longer struggle with that because I, I feel that the power is mine. I know how to tell a dynamic story and to suck the reader in. So one of the things that really interests me about what you said there is that you, you feel like your job is to entertain the audience first. And 
I I enjoy things like film analysis, symbolism, that sort of thing. They really kind of give the the story something extra. But I feel like people these days dive so far into that it kind of becomes like what the story is all about for them, and they they get kind of sucked into their own story, but they forget about the audience. Uh, what what level of um, symbolism do you use or do you just kind of let that happen as like a uh, icing on the cake or afterthought how, how does that affect your writing well uh, symbolism is there and it's part of being original but when i say that the job of the writer is to entertain and i say I, i'm trying to grab the reader by the throat and suck them into the narrative i want his total attention what is entertainment i had a great teacher once his name was jerry mcneely and he said you make them laugh a little bit you make them cry a little bit you scare the hell out of them, and that's entertainment. And there's a great deal of truth in that. Uh, I always begin with a compelling scene. I always set the table. I set the stage. I describe something that will draw the reader in, whether it's the surroundings, uh, the physical environment, or the protagonist's actions. Uh, but you got to start with a compelling scene. And from there, of course, the story is a dynamic narrative which means that it's never static. The hero is up, the hero is down, uh, the hero succeeds, the hero fails. The fate is always uh, in doubt. You never know how it's gonna end up. But at the end of the story, the story, the ending must come as both a complete surprise and in re and on reflection, perfectly natural. Uh, and, and one of the examples of that is the ending to the original Planet of the Apes. Uh, when they're going up the beach and see the Statue of Liberty, buried in the sand and, and uh, uh, Charlton Heston goes crazy uh, and you think wow it was earth all along and then you think of course of course it was earth and that's what I'm ending I'm aiming for in an ending now speaking of, of you know the the worlds and the characters and and these kind of things that help you go in intuitively uh, and I'm saying this wrong, I know, but you know, the, the when I say intuitively, it's like you said, like those little hints, those little clues that that kind of go by you during the story. But then, when there's the payoff, there it doesn't feel like a cheat. You weren't given red herrings or inconsequential plot points, that sort of thing. But also approaching the character going through that world, um, you know, sometimes the audience knows. Uh, a little more information than the character knows. And sometimes the, the audience is, is right there with the character and only gets that amount of information. How do you approach uh, a character? Say, uh, for example, um, well, I'll ask for two examples. Nexus was your creation and you worked with an artist, Steve Root, on that, who's a very talented artist. And now you're working on Offworlder. Uh, and this is a this is kind of based on historical events, but then taken into a fictional, like taking a historical type character and then putting it into a fictional universe with uh, extraordinary circumstances. Um, how do you kind of approach a character and, and get into their head that way? Do you do you feel uh, an excitement for that character? Do you see yourself as that character? Well, it's the writer's job to imagine every character of, about whom he's writing. And of course, I try to put my head, myself into the heads of my protagonists, be it Nexus, Badger, or, or Josh Pratt. Uh, but we, when you mention sometimes the audience knows things that are going to happen before the, uh, the protagonist does, that has to do often with point of view uh, and, and narrative voice. Uh, if you tell a, a story in the first person, you're pretty much stuck with one person's observations of everything. Uh, I do that occasionally, but I never do that totally in a book. I jump around from viewpoint to viewpoint. And when you go to another person's viewpoint, then you can set the seeds for a trap or uh, an obstacle which the protagonist must overcome. Uh, we know that there's a mugger lurking right around that corner, but the hero doesn't know until he, until he turns that corner. And that's one of the things I mean. Uh, you also mentioned uh, the payoff at the end when it all comes together. And that has to do with resonance, uh, how to make a story resonate. And you do that by planting the seeds early. Uh, or as, as Chekhov said, if you put a gun on the wall in the first scene 
you better have somebody use that gun later on, or the reader will feel irritated if not cheated. And that's what I mean by resonance. You plant the seeds early and you harvest them later. Sometimes I will put something into a book, a character most often, and I don't know why. I mean, the, the scene calls for that character at that moment. And then 20 or 30,000 words down the road, I realize that that character is the key to the resolution of the story. That's uh, something that's very interesting to me because, uh, again, like I said, you see sometimes in stories people just put in red herrings or they, they put in an, uh, an obstacle or a, an event. And I've actually had, as a writer myself, I've had arguments with people when it, back when I was uh, making short films with friends. Uh, we would come up with kind of little gimmicks to lead a character into a situation and then I would write that gimmick into the end of the story. And they're like, well, it's kind of stupid that that gimmick's there at the end. I'm like, well, we, we set it up at the beginning. You're like, well, yeah, that was just there to get the characters from A to B. I'm like, yeah, but you can't just, because you're making a promise to your audience. Uh, you, you, you set it as planting seeds or, or kind of, um, uh, I forget the term you use. But yeah, to me, it's always been like every, every, element that you introduce is a promise to your audience that they are uh that you bothered with the, them with that thing so therefore uh they're not going to have that their time ultimately wasted by that thing but y you'll yeah you can leave your audience with going like well why did they do that when, when will that ever pay off i think these days in television writing uh people kind of get lazy with that because they think oh well in the next season or you know movies the next episode all this episodic stuff they go oh we'll find a way to pay that off later um or they just forget about it entirely but uh, anyway uh in terms of progressing a story though i'm always interested in terms of comic books uh, in the idea that the the act of turning the page is uh is kind of what makes the comic book reading experience interactive with the audience. Do you use the the turn of the page, or is there a certain way you set up panels so that you know that uh, there's a rhythm and a progression to it? Yes. Uh, when you're transitioning from one scene to another or from one point of view to another, you do that on a fresh page. Uh, nobody likes to turn the page, and there's two panels having to do where you just were, and then the rest of the page, you you shift uh, point of view and, and the location to somebody completely different. It's awkward. Uh, comics are a physical medium. Uh, they have a pulse and a rhythm by themselves, which has to do with how many panels per page, when do you blow it up, when do you shrink it down, uh, how much dialogue do you use. Uh, and you have to be aware of that pulse and that rhythm. And I think that it's a minor uh, breach of et of, of uh, etiquette to s switch points of view and scenes in the middle of a page. Uh, a page is like you come to the end of the page and there's time for a new scene. That's when you cut to a new scene from page to page. Uh, what about uh, cliffhangers and and uh, and surprises? As do you find that the it's the same deal that you you want to kind of bring the audience to a certain point and kind of rev them up and then hit them with something, not just a scene transition, but like a surprise or, um, you know, there it seems to me that all sorts of opportunities to, uh, like you said, go, going around the corner to see the Statue of Liberty. If that was a comic, you would definitely like see Charlton Heston looking shocked in the last panel and you turn the page and there you'd see the Statue of Liberty. Um, it, do you have like a favorite page turn moment, not just in your own books, but in uh, it's like, is there a memorable comic where you turn the page and you were just like, whoa, I'm glad I didn't flip through and skip ahead before I uh, read this thing. Not really. Uh, I used to do that all the time, especially when I was writing Nexus, I would end with a cliffhanger. I'd have some, some creep come in the door with a gun, uh, which is uh, Raven Chandler said, if you're, if you're not sure what to happen next, always have a guy come in the door with a gun. There's that gun again. It's probably Chekhov's gun. Uh, but I don't do that anymore. But when I did that, then I think, well, I've done this. How do I justify it? How do I rationalize it? How do I spin it into a good story? And that made me think about it. 
And uh, I thought about it, and I would proceed again, panel by panel, justifying that brute coming in the door with a gun so that it made sense, so that the reader goes, ah, oh, yeah, so the reader, that's, that's why that happened. Of course that happened. That's why it makes sense. Uh, now, I don't do that these days. I'm much more methodical. <clears throat> As I said, I write a complete outline, which is the beginning, the middle, and an end. But the outline isn't everything. Uh, and there inevitably changes when I'm working on the finished script or the finished text, if it's a comic or a novel, uh, because I believe that the uh, writer has to surprise himself if he's going to surprise the reader. Uh, and, and many of the best moments in fiction came because the writer surprised himself and then he surprised the reader. Is uh, the interaction with the artist, um, is that a big factor in your writing or do you just kind of act right as if you're also the director and the artist is to use a movie term the artist is like the the cast that you're moving around or is it more of a uh, a give and take in your relationship with the artist well it depends on the artist i always try to write to an artist's strength now if you look at the indiegogo for offworlder and you scroll down you will be stunned by the art. All I did was write a script. I knew Jordy was good, but I had no idea he was that good. When you look at that art, it has the same impact as the same time as the first time you saw Steranko or Neil Adams or Barry Smith on Conan. He's that good. Uh, and But I, as I said, I wrote full script. And when I do that, I describe each panel in detail. It's not excessive. Uh, if I write a 24 page script, it usually comes out to 16 typed pages. So it's not a monster, but everything is there that you need, including the captions and the dialogue. It's essential that a comic book writer uh, give the artist the dialogue so that the artist knows how to cast his characters and, and how they should act. Uh, nobody would do a, a movie script without completing all the dialogue. I, and I know there are lots of exceptions to this. <laughs> where people kind of hemmed and hawed and put it together in the, the editing room for it. But a good writer is in control of his fact, of, of his, uh, his story, uh, of every part of that story, and he envisions it from beginning to end. Now, there are some artists uh, who disagree with what I do, uh, and uh, that's fine. If they can make a case for doing it some other way, and I hear them out and I agree with them, then, then I'll go with it. Well, the art is absolutely beautiful. I'm I'm very impressed with uh, the colors as well. The colors very much complement the art, and uh, I recommend to anybody listening, uh, please go over to the Indiegogo and check it out because Mike is not lying. This artwork is very dynamic. It's very expressive. This is one of the things that I really love most about um, comic books as a medium. I mean, I, I work in film for the most part, but comics are still my number one favorite medium because they they give you kind of the uh, the best of every other medium. And at the same time, they have an opportunity to do things that no, no other medium can do. But one of the things I love about comic books is, and I see a lot of people not taking advantage of, is how expressive the characters can be in ways that you just can't get actors to be without it looking ridiculous. But in comic books, it just flows. And yeah, this work is very dynamic. Uh, the art is- and, and again, the name of the book is Offworlder. Yes, Offworlder, Blood in the Jungle, and Ravage. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this story? Um, how, did you, how did you come about this story? And, and what, without giving away too much, obviously, uh, what can readers expect? Uh, What's the promise of this story? Well, Ben Henderson contacted me. I'm not sure how exactly I met Ben, uh, but we hit it off and he sent me his notes on Offworlder, which is his own creation uh, and something he's been thinking about for many years. Ben has been writing novels and screenplays and he said he wanted to do a comic and he wanted me to write it. And he gave me all the elements, which were based on his own ancestors from Scotland. Ben is from uh, Scottish stock and he had an ancestor named Henry Gunn. And this is the story. Seventh century Scotland. Henry Gunn leads his clan in a ferocious battle with Viking invaders, but with victory in sight, he is ripped from space and time by an alien race. 
the Anunnaki seek a champion to stop another alien race from conquering all known space. Aided by the Egyptian goddess Serah, Gunn undergoes a hideous transformation, becoming something other than human, able to move through time and space at will, yet unable to save his wife and child. The fate of civilization rests on the shoulders of a troubled demigod. In the tradition of the stars, my destination and the silver surfer, Offworlder is a star-spanning science fiction saga that will keep you riveted from first page to last. Beautiful. And that's, and that's what it's about. It also, I mean, the plot also reminds me a little bit of the tradition of uh, Princess of Mars, John Carter getting kind of astral projected uh, from his body onto Mars and, and having all sorts of adventures. It sounds to me, too, like this is something that uh, I, I'm assuming that there's a single story arc in what your Indiegogo is for, but something that could continue on afterwards. Yes, uh, the initial story arc will be five issues. But since we de decided to combine the first two issues, the initial book is going to be 48 pages. Beautiful. That's a lot of content. Um, are you guys, uh, so you guys print this uh, and ship it out as the Indiegogo uh, goes along. Uh, what What's your experience been like with crowdfunding? Is this your first time crowdfunding a comic book? No, we crowdfunded Q-Ball, which I created with Barry McLean Jr. Q-Ball is a martial arts espionage thriller. Uh, we got it printed, we sent it out, we fulfilled all our requirements in pretty good time. People were very happy with it. It's a brilliant book. Uh, the only copies you can get right now are from Barry or me. However, I believe they're going to be picked up later this year by another publisher. There are five issues in all. Barry's finished penciling three of them. Uh, if you haven't seen Barry's art, again, your jaw will hit the floor. He's a total original. And he gets better every time he sits down at the table. Well, this is another thing that's really interesting and exciting to me right now is the whole crowdfunding movement. Uh, it's It's been a bit, you know, there's there's been a lot of a divide among it. You have, you know, for years we've had Marvel, DC, uh, Image Comics, some other publishers like Malibu, Valiant. Um, but... Now, a lot of people are, you know, they, they're they dissatisfied with the quality of comics now, so they're taking matters into their own hands. And I really get the sense that this is kind of a, a moment in comic book history. I don't think people are seeing that right now, but I kind of feel like, you know, the, the market has been full, just, just been glut of all of these kind of innocuous inane stories filling the shelves and the real quality work seems to be happening on the crowdfunding because it's produced by people who really care about creating comic books and the people supporting them also really care um, of course there's been a lot of kind of kickback people saying that you know these are people who they can't get published by a real company or they're just on the internet begging for money uh, you know, so I think that kind of comes from a little bit of a place of bitterness that the industry has changed in a way that's beyond their control. Um, but you know, what, what are you seeing out there? Are you, um, you know, is, is, has crowdfunding been kind of like a last resort or is crowdfunding a new movement that you're excited to be a part of? Well, it's a little bit of both. Uh, comics are contracting. They're in a state of free fall. They don't know whether to shit or go blind. There are many factors leading to this, many factors, not the least of which is the rise of video games, because frankly, your average mainstream comic book for four or five dollars can't compete for in, in terms of bang for buck with a good video game. Would you rather read this comic, which is gonna take 15 minutes at most, or play Grand Theft Auto, which will suck you in so that you lose all track of time and you're doing that for hours. There's also a certain illiteracy uh, problem going on right now. A lot of kids just don't read. They stare at their phones all day. They get all their information from their phone and, and they watch movies. Well, you'd think with the success of all these superhero movies, it would translate into comic sales, but it hasn't. For, for those reasons and many others, uh, for years, we said the illogical movies to sell comics in the lobbies of movie theaters, but it hasn't happened for a variety of reasons. Uh, there is also an impression 
that many modern comics, especially from the big two, are not very well written. Uh, and that doesn't mean that all the crowdfunded comics are well written either. I've seen some gorgeous crowdfunded comics that aren't too well written. Uh, all I can do is ensure that my comics are well written, and I assure you they are. Yeah, it's funny because there was a time where a lot of people were trying to guess, like, where do we put comics so they'll be more popular? And I think that was kind of actually lost the thread of, of what we were really trying to accomplish, which is, you know, create something good. Um, and this was it Steve Martin said, be so good they can't ignore you. I mean, it's easier said than done. But kind of this idea of, of, you know, pandering to, you know, movie theater um, lobbies or, you know, we've got our comics in Walmart. Well, you know, who cares? They're just kind of like thrown in like the, you know, in with the D&D &D cards and, and they're scattered all over the place. Uh, what about digital? Are, do you guys have a, a, a digital option in your in your Indiegogo? Yes, I see it here. Digital off world or digital copy. Um, you know, th that's a. Uh, you say people are staring at their phones, and yeah, that's true. We're all kind of interacting through our phones these days. Um, I still like to hold a paper copy in my Me hand. Me too. But there's a magic that happens when you look at a two-dimensional page and it sucks you into a three-dimensional world. Yeah. Well, I also I think it was Stan Lee that said something to the effect of, um, "It's a medium. It doesn't require electricity. Uh, you know, just like books, paper books. You know, it's." it activates when you pick it up and engage with it. It requires no electricity. It just requires, it's a, it's a experience between the, what's on the paper and, and who the reader is. He also said comics are like boobs. You'd rather <laughs> hold one in your hand than look at a picture of one. Yeah, exactly. I think he said that sure they look great on your screen, but wouldn't you rather hold one in your hand? Yeah, yeah. yeah I love that quote. Um, now, so you're also a novelist, is and and you you know we talked about this a little already, but um, is the the experience of writing a novel uh, is there anything like the page turn in that, or is it purely just uh, you know figuring out how long your average chapter is? What what is the what's the big difference between novels and comic book writing besides the obvious you know ones has a visual aspect to it and the other is just symbols on paper. Well, I, I, it's the amount of work involved, but also a novel uh, relies solely on the power of words. And it has to entertain on every page. There can be no dull parts because otherwise you're going to turn off the reader. Every part of that novel has to be interesting. Well, what makes it interesting? And the answer is everything. The protagonist, the plot, the dialogue, the scene. You have to set a realistic scene. You have to make people care about your protagonist. Uh, I believe that strongly, that, that you've got to give the reader somebody with whom they can identify, or else they're not going to care. If you're telling a story about an ugly, despicable man who does ugly, despicable things, unless you're Cormac McCarthy, mm -hmm. people aren't going to read that. And, and what about yours? So now you have uh, two novels available right now on Amazon. Is that correct? I have, I have 14 novels available on Amazon. Oh, 14. Well, yeah. do, the, do you have two in a new series, well, though? You've got yeah, a series going it, at the moment. Well, you see, those are the biker books. They've just been re-released by Wolfpack. But for all essential purposes, they're being released for the first time because nobody saw them on my previous publisher. God bless them. They meant well. But their plan ended with publishing the book. They didn't know how to get it into bookstores. They didn't do any advertising. It was just there. Well, Wolfpack took one look at my stuff and said, yeah, you belong with us. And they fought for me. And they cut a deal with the previous publisher to get all my books. And the books are the Biker series. The first one is Biker. And it's about Josh Pratt, a reformed motorcycle hoodlum who goes to prison, finds God, gets out, and tries to turn his life around and becomes involved in a horrendous missing persons case. And this one is going to just make your head explode. Uh, the second one is called Sons of Privilege. And it's about uh, popular college athletes found drowned after a night of drinking. And in each case, a smiley face is painted on a wall nearby. These are known as the smiley face killings and they're real. If you Google them, you'll see that the FBI had a task force for many years trying to solve them. And that is what Sons of Privilege is about. 
The third one, Not Fade Away, is about a woman living in a trailer park who has a song that was left to her by a famous singer who was once her lover many years ago. The singer perished in a club fire, and she hears the song being played by an insurance company to sell insurance, and she contacts Josh, and she says, I own this song, and she shows him a paper by the author, the famous rocker, and says, I give this song to Marissa for her for all time. She owns it. She has all the proceeds. Uh, and she asked Josh to prove that she's the rightful owner of that song. And it sets him off on an amazing journey to Hollywood. It eventually leads to a showdown with a, a, a killer in an abandoned automobile factory in Waukesha. The fourth one, Sons of Bitches, is about a woman who puts out a Muhammad comic and has to hire Josh to protect her. Oh, wow. The so, fifth one. Oh, yeah, sorry. Right. Go ahead. No, no. I was, I, the, fifth, the fifth one is Buffalo Hump, and it's about how Josh is hired to protect a charismatic Sioux blues musician at the opening of a new casino in South Dakota. And the sixth one, Bloodline, is about how Josh joins a paramilitary biker group uh, that makes his living stealing weapons. That Those all sound incredible. He He kind of sounds in a way like a i don't want to say a superhero but he sounds almost like a like an alternate batman or maybe a sherlock holmes except he's he's come from a a different place and and uh but he he seems to be like the guy you go to if you uh Well, well yes and no he's no superhero he's a very modest man uh he never mentions his religion he doesn't wisecrack uh he's flawed he has a lot of trouble he gets he gets beat up all the time uh, my inspiration was uh, John D. McDonald's Travis McGee. I knew I wanted to be a writer the first time I picked up one of his novels. Uh, and I hope that Josh Pratt is in that tradition. It's the same tradition as Philip Marlowe or uh, uh, Jack Reacher. Uh, he's a guy with one foot in civility and one foot in the outlaw. Uh, he's the guy that you go to when you've exhausted all other resources and you've been wronged. And Josh will listen. And if he says, yeah, this isn't right, he'll set out to make it right. That sounds very cool. It, it sounds like you kind of uh, come from a uh, uh, a place that enjoys a lot of kind of the more gritty uh, underworld crime uh, type of situations. These, these are grim novels. If you like gritty crime novels, you'll love this. So what do you, uh, what do you think uh, informs your writing beyond just what you're a fan of are you someone that feels like you're coming from a certain uh a certain place that that uh i, I guess for lack of a better word uh, a, for a place of values that that influences all your writing or are you just more of an experimental type where you're going like this is a, a kind of story that i want to tell and i'll see where it takes me Oh, no, I believe in uh, a moral story. I think that the reader expects that, too, that at the end, evil will be punished. A good may not be exalted, but at the very end, evil must be punished, or else the reader will feel cheated. Uh, there's uh, the guy that wrote... Uh, uh, oh, I'm losing it. <laughs> But anyhow, that this always happens when I, when I, you know, these names that I can conjure up instantly when I'm not on camera, I, they, I, I blank on them when I am. But uh, the book has to end with a moral epiphany, and because it's a recurring character, a series character, he has to survive from book to book. Sometimes he barely survives, but he does survive. And now I write three kinds of books: uh, the Josh Pratt novels, which are gritty crime; the horror novels. And Disco, which is a, a novel for the whole family, it's about a boy who adopts a mongrel pup and trains it to be world disc dog champion. And <laughs> I wrote that. I wrote that because my wife. I said, Anne, won't you read one of my books? She says, She said, I can't read any of your books. They're too horrible. Write something I can read. But Disco uh, was an idea that I had for 20 years, and I finally, at the moment, arrived. I said, Well, I got to write this, and I got to write it. I always say I don't choose my stories. My stories choose me. And they're a result of, of all my influences and what I like and what I would like to see. Now, uh, I'm writing a novel now that's, that's completely different. It's called Florida Man. And it's a, <laughs> it's a profane comic novel. And uh, it's exactly what you think it is, and yet it's not. 
Yeah, I heard you read a little bit of this on another one. It's it's really like a just an outrageous character doing outrageous things, and it's all based on kind of how Florida seems to always come up in the more outrageous stories you read on the internet. Yeah, I've tried to incorporate every Florida man's story, but you can't do them all because there's so many. But I, I mean, there there are alligators, uh, there are shootouts, there are fist fights, there's road rage. Uh, Gary gets thrown in jail four times during the course of the book, I think. Uh, but in the end, he perseveres because he's not just a dumb redneck. He's a guy with soul and character. And you'll see this when you read the book. Well, that's then, I like hearing that because the, it's so easy to fall into a stereotype and kind of make a one dimensional yes, character. Yeah, yeah. But to have you have a character that does all those outrageous things and still get your audience to root for them, that's the real accomplishment uh you know to get get the audience on on that character's side because it's it's so easy for people to turn their nose up at uh those exactly. who they kind of you know despise or or just seem as like stupid but, you know people kind of they always find someone to look down on but to, to find yeah. that character and have you root for them that's a great thing in many ways uh, gary's the most admirable character in the book <laughs> And they're not all low lives. I mean, it's it's a, it's a real story about it's got heartbreak, it's got loss, but mostly it's got a lot of laughs. Well, I I, I look forward. Well, I'm looking. At, you're selling me on all of your stories. All these sound freaking fantastic. And uh, uh, there's something else I wanted to ask you. Oh yes, now I'm what I I don't know how I refer to myself, but I'm kind of a I'm a sensitive audience member. I'll engage a good story, but if it gets if it puts me into an emotional position that's too heavy, no matter how good it is, um, you know, it, it starts to become feel like a chore to to read or to watch. I'm, I'm certainly bad at watching in movies awkward situations because a lot of people find them funny. I was actually reading Chuck Dixon's novel Gomer's, um, and I, I had to put it down for a bit. I'm going to try and go back to it because you know it's Chuck Dixon, and I I want to try and finish it, but. Uh, it's a zombie book, and uh, I kept having really horrible zombie nightmares uh, from it. You know, how do you? Chuck, Chuck's writing is so powerful. It is. Uh, it really is. I was, re I was reading Levon's Kin, and I almost had to stop because it was so gruesome. I it, couldn't believe what he was putting in there. But every word rings true. I mean, Chuck is a master storyteller. I have to be careful as an audience member not to put myself in a position where because st something hits me if it's well done, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, a tough thing. It'll stay with me for days. It's like uh, almost like taking a mood altering chemical. So I have to be very careful. Do you do you find that there's a, a balance to keep with your audience? Can you hit them too hard? Even if it's well done, is it is there like things you have to keep in mind that way? Well, I don't know. As I say, my first rule is to entertain. If it's entertaining, it passes muster. But And then I, I go back to what Jerry McNeely said. You make them laugh a little bit. You make them cry a little bit. You scare the hell out of them, and that's entertainment. And you have to care about your protagonist. And once you care about the protagonist, then you can put them in peril. As long as you don't cheat the audience, as long as you don't kill the protagonist off for no good reason and end up with a nihilistic book yeah. where where there's no good payoff and you and the reader says well what was that about you know i i wanted this guy to succeed and you killed him off and, and people you know there's the i i again i'm a big believer stories matter if you suck the audience member in and you give them something that starts to matter to them and then you pull the rug out from underneath them uh you know that is a big deal you know, uh, people have taken the time uh, to experience your story. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget the first time that that happened to me. I'm a, a big fan of the first two Aliens movies. And then Alien 3 came along and I was just, uh, you know, so felt so cheated. I've actually I actually have a series of videos on my channel talking about why I think Alien 3 was uh just bad choices all around because it really mattered to me. It, we really, and other people went like, no, Alien 3 is the best one. What are you talking about? You know, and I'm going like, what, why do you want this? So, you know, and that's a personal feeling. It matters to you. So, you know, your, your audience is trusting you to uh, not cheat them in that way. I guess some people do want it. I, I don't quite understand why. 
Every program acquires a constituency. You know what that means? It means you put something out there, no matter how shitty you're repelling, some people are going to like it. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, it's it's you're absolutely right, and I I do agree with that statement. It's just an interesting phenomena that there's there's always something out there. Um, and you know, honestly, that's fine. Uh, this and it comes down to you know people talk about it, they debate about it, they argue about it, they criticize, and I think everybody gains a little more knowledge uh, about what to do next in their own storytelling because of that. So I I don't begrudge it, but at the same time, yeah, it's always a bummer, especially when it comes to franchises that you love, and then somebody comes in with a set of value that conflicts and so they feel like they have to impose that set of values uh on the news stories and kind of almost retcon uh what came before in favor of their own thing or in a way give a middle finger to the audience that liked it before i don't understand that mentality and that's probably why uh there's an opportunity now for again coming back to your uh you know off or book why this an opportunity for people who are dissatisfied to crowdfund their own stuff and find that audience that agrees with them, that sees eye, eye to eye with them. Yeah, and then there's J.R.R. Martin. <laughs> I haven't read any of his stuff. Have you? I tried, but I did watch the entirety of Game of Thrones, and I enjoyed it very much. But, you know, a lot of people complain that he kept killing off all the likable characters. Well, I guess that's his thing. You know? That's something, again, that was something that the, uh, <laughs> it's funny to me, but again, I grew up as a big horror fan. And then suddenly my mom is watching The Walking Dead. And that was one of the things that they said was like, oh, anybody can die. You know, you don't know what to expect. And they kind of saw that as a good thing. But yeah, but then they would complain when uh, a beloved character would get killed off. And I think ultimately they ended up, I mean, they've lost a lot of their audience. I don't think their ratings are quite as good anymore. And they, uh, because all the likable characters are gone. So people kind of went, okay, I, I'm out. I don't need to be around anymore. So I think that they, instead of creating jumping on points, people always talk about creating jumping on points for series and stories. Uh, they create jumping off points and kind of do themselves a disservice. But uh, anyway, well, I think that uh, this, this has been a great conversation. I'm going to wrap it up, but I would like you to stick around for our post show where we'll talk a little more. This is for the Indiegogo supporters. Uh, but before we do, is there anything else that you would like to say? We'll leave a link in the description for uh, Offworlder. And uh, also, if you want to get, send me any links for your books, I'd love to leave those in the descriptions as well. Um, but yeah, do you have any, uh, to be kind of Jerry Springer, do you have any final thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I would advise any person to always carry a hat. A hat? Mm-hmm. We're just going to leave it at that, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, Mike, thank you very much for being on the show. I'm very excited about this series, and you've been a Great first episode guest. Uh, so for those listening, anybody wanting to make comics, anyone interested in engaging comics, check these out. Uh, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to discover. Uh, again, I'm very excited about it, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Chris.